Hello, everyone. I'm Megan Sullivan, and welcome to History and Games, a podcast where I play amazing video games and talk about the amazing real history hidden inside our favorite games. Today, I'm super excited to have back on the show author MJ Gallagher, who's going to be talking about his new book, Greek Myths That Inspired Final Fantasy VII. We both are holding up a copy for those who are watching. <laughs> So super excited to talk about that because Greek myths and Final Fantasy VII are two very favorite subjects of mine. Before awesome. we get into that, though, I have one quick housekeeping um, note for the audience, which is I will be participating in the upcoming uh, interactive Archeo gaming conference, Hit Points and History. It's taking place March 9th through the 10th, 2024. I will be presenting on March 9th at 1.15 Pacific standard time and my topic is how the underworld helps the gaming world how the eschatological beliefs of the ancient greeks can help developers with world building world building being the main theme of the conference this is a very exciting conference there are academics professionals and gaming enthusiasts all participating super excited to be a part of it and you can get your tickets over at hitpointscon.com they're 25 dollars each i hope to see everyone there. And I am not the only one who is participating in conferences and conventions. MJ, you were actually recently at KuboCon in the UK. Okay. And I saw your social media posts about that. It sounds like you had a splendid time. Your book, Greek Myths That Inspired Final Fantasy VII, apparently sold out in record time. And you got to meet one of the voice actors for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which by the way, is out right now for everyone to play. And my first question is, how does that feel to have your book sell out and get to meet? I believe it was a voice of Kate Sith and don't at me folks, Square Enix <laughs> confirmed that it is pronounced at least in the game, Kate Sith. <laughs> it was. Uh, first, first of all, thank you so much for having me back, Megan. I, I hugely appreciate it. I had a lot of fun uh, when we spoke about my Norse Myths book uh, last time around. Uh, so it's, it's great to, to be able to sit down and chat about this one. Um, yeah, I, I had a wonderful time at KubelCon uh, over the weekend. I've, I've been very lucky uh, to have been working uh, in partnership with KubelCon for years now. Uh, I've produced quite a lot of, of content, uh, both in books, video series and various other bits and pieces. Um, so it was great to, to go back. So the, the event itself was in Birmingham uh, in, in the UK. Uh, it was a two-day event. The first one was just to celebrate Final Fantasy in general, uh, and the second day was specifically in relation to Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, uh, and just a, a, a launch event celebrating, uh, you know, the, the the game coming out. Um, it so it just so happens that the last time KubelCon uh, hosted an event in Birmingham in the UK. Uh, I launched uh, one of my first novels, uh, which was about the Nibelheim incident. Um, so it was really neat. We did a, a limited edition uh, copy of the book. Uh, so it was it was great to, to be able to go back and just uh, live in the moment again uh, to, to, to experience all that. So the Nibelheim incident sold out, the Greek myths book sold out, the Norse myths book sold out. Uh, it also uh, corroborated on a Final Fantasy VIII novel that sold out as well. Um, and it was it was just incredible to I guess just feel that love and appreciation for for what for me is is always really just a hobby and a passion. Um, so at at the event, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, Paul Tinto, uh, who is the voice of Kate Seth, was there. Uh, we won't talk about the 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 Kate She element of that. Um, but also um, we were we were delighted to to also have John Eric Bentley, who is the voice of Barrett. We had Caleb Pierce, who is the voice of Zach, uh, and Gideon Emery, who is the voice of Biggs as well. Uh, all of them were in attendance too, so it was it was a huge a huge celebration of Final Fantasy VII uh, all day on on Sunday. That sounds amazing. And Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is out now, and I'm not even going to ask you if you're excited or how excited. Uh, you must be thrilled that it is yeah. finally out. I'm going to ask you. What is the thing you're looking forward to in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth? Because it is a remake. It's got a bigger open world, more story beats, more character interactions. What are you looking forward to the most? Um, I um, well, First of all, I'm actually looking forward to being able to get all this pent-up energy out. Uh, I've, <laughs> I've, 
I've been I've been so excited that it, it's sort of borderline hysteria now that I I, I I just don't even know what to do uh, with with all the, this sort of nerves and anxiety and, and energy. Just yeah, I just want to 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 properly delve right in. Um, you know, obviously the the last couple of years for me personally, I've I've been uh, working away in the corner of the mythology side. Um, of the Final Fantasy VII saga. Uh, so as, as time has gone on, I've, I've really started to realise that not, not only is Final Fantasy VII a, a huge deal for me personally, but my my specific area of interest is the, the mythology aspect of it. And already from the demo, uh, there are things that are appearing um, from the, the, the north, uh, sorry, the, the north side of things, that things that I spoke about in my book years ago, you know, there, there's there's additional detail that has already shown up in the, the demo. So I'm hopeful that as we move forward, there will be more and more uh, mythology links that I can sink my teeth into. Yeah, it seems like a wellspring of myth and history. I think that's the sort of magic of Final Fantasy VII. Um, what inspired specifically this book? What was a moment in Final Fantasy VII where you thought, gosh, there are a lot of Greek mythology references yeah. in this game. Was there any particular story beat or character that sort of inspired this book it was yeah so um greek greek mythology was something that i uh had a, a sort of base may, maybe like high school level knowledge of um i'd not delved too deeply in it into it uh, as an adult uh, and after after i released my norse mythology book um the next the next step for me was to to do the same thing again, but look at a different type of mythology. And I I, I think the the obvious one that jumped out to me was was Greek mythology, because there were already an, a handful of things that I could see that were um, relevant, uh, and and that I could you know use the same format and the same formula, and I I'd, I'd written the Norse myth mythology book uh, using so things such as the summons like Hades and Phoenix and uh, Typhon um, or uh, the, obviously the, uh, the 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 game Dodge of Cerberus you know straight away has has the name Cerberus in it but I <laughs> I'd identified that there were a number of links between Vincent's story arc in that game and the labors of Heracles um, I, I was quite interested in the idea that Crisis Core itself follows quite a number of story beats uh, to do with the Trojan War um, and various other little bits and pieces um, that I I felt there was going to be enough content to perhaps fill the same size of book again. Um, but I didn't expect it to be as deep as, as it ended up being. Um, you know, I, I think in hindsight, because of the, the sheer volume of, of Greek and classical mythology in general, um, it was always going to be like that. Uh, again, the, the, I think we touched on this last time around as well, that the, the lead scenario writer for Final Fantasy VII, Kazushige Nojima, um, his professional background was actually in uh, writing and directing uh, Japanese video games about Greek mythology. So already... It, it wasn't it wasn't just someone who had a, a sort of surface level understanding he he was someone that, that both on a, a from a professional perspective and, and also a personal perspective as it turns out um had a real love for greek mythology so the the further down these rabbit holes i went the, the bigger and bigger and bigger the book got so uh yeah i there were a few things to begin with that I wanted to look at, but it ended up just being an enormous project, and I'm very happy with how it turned out. Uh, but it wasn't, or as much bigger than I, than I planned. <laughs> well, I certainly have enjoyed the book, and you know, you had mentioned you. that you kind of initially had sort of a high school understanding of Greek mythology. Of course, you have an encyclopedic knowledge of Final Fantasy VII, but I'm always curious about the process the author goes through. What was the process like researching for this book? And what were some of the challenges that you ran into? Um, I, I started this one by, first of all, listing or, or examining the, the, the compilation of Final Fantasy VII and picking out anything that I felt was worth exploring from a mythology perspective. 
So I spent a lot of time um, reading books. Um, so I had books by, you know, Robert Graves. Um, I, had, I had books by um, Edith Hamilton, um, or more recently, um, stories um, that have been compiled by authors such as Stephen Fry. So I looked at a variety of authors telling the same myths to try and extract important pieces of information that I could then hone in on by, you know, actually looking at translations of the original Greek texts or using websites such as theoi.com, which, you know, extensively explore the text and it's, it's almost like an encyclopedia of references, which was infinitely valuable uh, to me. So my my process was to to come up with ideas of things that I could write about to then focus on them to establish whether or not there was actually enough content there and then to structure the book in such a way that um the the myth cycle in particular for Greek mythology while you know writers over you know centuries have touched on various things the the myth cycle itself really moves from the creation of the world to the rise of the the Olympians um, to their their sort of golden age and eventually sort of fading away while the demigods and the heroes come into play and eventually it sort of culminates in in Troy um so I I looked at it almost from a chronological point of view as well where I would be able to start to put into place things like for example in, in the book the, the the first the first chapter that, that starts to examine the parallels between the, the mythology and Final Fantasy is the creation of the world and that parallels um Genova's arrival and on the on the planet in Final Fantasy. So I wanted to you know start at the beginning and slowly build the world so that there was all, already this base understanding as the reader progressed through the book rather than sort of jump from topic to topic that you know you might not quite have the context uh, that, that would really help with with the reader's understanding right and what do you think the biggest challenge was because I, I i find that a lot of these myths kind of contradict each other obviously they are crafted over yeah. many many centuries so is there anything in particular that you thought oh man this is hard how do i <laughs> how do i process this or how do i get around it um I, yeah, you, you're absolutely right that there are there are so many variations of the same story with altering details and they are contradictory. And sometimes that, that was actually beneficial because there were details that could be found in one source that perhaps went in the other, but they they helped support the argument. Um, uh, you know, so long as there, there wasn't a, a glaring uh, contradiction in play. I actually found the biggest challenge was probably the, the sheer volume of mythology um, because the more I investigated, the more it opened doors into other topics. And there, there were maybe three or four occasions where I actually had to think seriously about restructuring the book itself just so that I could swap content around in chapters to make it more coherent um, and, and flow better and things like that. So yeah, I think, I think the biggest challenge is was probably the more I read, the more I learned, the more rabbit holes it took me down. And the, it had even even towards the end, even in the, 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 the final couple of months before the, the book was published, I was still rearranging chapters to to um to, to one degree or another. What was your favorite chapter to write? Was there one in particular that was, sticks out that was especially fun for you or a favorite topic? Yeah, there, um, there's, there is one um, in particular, and it was not one that I ever anticipated actually being in the book, and it's not it's not one that I thought was going to be my favourite chapter, but um, from, from the outset, uh, from the outset, sorry, um, you know, I, like I touched upon, I, I wanted to do chapters about the summons. I, I felt that those were, you know, pretty... Uh, sure thing and the, the early chapters about um, the creation of the world or the live stream or um, you know these these were subjects that you know I was comfortable enough that there was always going to be content but one of the ones that I hadn't anticipated was actually this, the, the chapter about 
the parallels between Genesis and Dionysus. Um, and I know last time we spoke, um, you you said that uh, some of the information in the Norse mythology book about how that may have inspired Genesis had given you a, a different perspective on the character. So I, I hope that perhaps the same thing has, has happened this time around, that um, I, it's, it's always, I've, I've known for a number of years that uh, Genesis is a very controversial character and I, I think he's perhaps a misunderstood character because there is, I, I, I don't think it would be exaggerating to say that he is one of the more complex of the saga and the mythology and the, the religious lore that um, lies beneath his character is so deep that you kind of have to have an understanding of classical mythology, have to have an understanding of Judeo-Christian religion, specifically Gnosticism. Um, there's also a degree of Jungian psychology that's going on in there. And, and you know, again, a little bit of Norse mythology thrown in. So there's, in order to fully understand him, the, there's there's so much so much going on, but uh, I hadn't I hadn't expected the Dionysus um, angle, and when I learned more about uh, the character and how um, or the the god, sorry, Dionysus, and how he was connected to winemaking, how he was connected to being the leader of outcasts, how he was, you know, all about breaking shackles of individuals who were oppressed in society, how, you know, he represented um, overcoming death. All of it just started to fall into place. And I think that was the one I had the most fun with because I, it was the one I least expected, I guess. Yeah, I was I was pleasantly surprised by that too. I hadn't thought about it until I read that chapter. And Genesis is not one of my favorite characters, but every time you sort of go back and sort of peel back the layers of this character, yeah. uh, you sort of understand a little bit more about him. And I actually had a favorite chapter myself, which is all yeah. about Eris' connection to the goddess Persephone, yeah. who is an interesting goddess. She's a goddess of spring rebirth, but also the dread queen of the underworld. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to sort of ask you, you know, in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and Remake, we have the introduction to the whispers, right? Which yeah. you also compare to sort of the Greek fates. Yeah. fates. And um, I was wondering because, and I have completely blacked out, you know, like media blacked out the game. I don't want mm -hmm. any spoilers to Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, but Square Enix has been teasing that maybe, maybe not Cloud and his friends can uh, defy fate or get yeah. away from fate. And I wanted to ask you, is that a good idea? How do you feel about, and this is, I'm going to say spoiler warning for those who have no idea yeah. anything about Final Fantasy VII, but this is a pretty old game originally from 1997. Yeah. So if we talk about the fate of Aerith, you know, and how she's like Persephone and how it's almost like she sort of has to die to get the powers to help her friends. Like she becomes yeah. more powerful in a way. But is it a good idea to change her fate in this game? You know, is what what is Aerith if she is not sort of this this goddess of of rebirth and regeneration and sort of having that power of the afterlife? Yeah. What do you think? Is it a good idea or a bad idea? Uh, I I personally think it would be a bad idea. Um, for I think one of the the most important things that uh, Persephone represents is the cycle of of life and death. Um, and the, the one of the key thing themes within Final Fantasy VII, the original game was um, processing grief and how individuals react, but also that, you know, this idea that, that death is perhaps not the end. Um, it is part of this cycle of life where an individual will return to the live stream and the spirit energy will diffuse and eventually will then become part of another uh, living individual. So for Persephone to represent, in, or for, for the Greeks, Persephone represented the, the cycle of life in that for six months of the year, um, she would return to the, the upper world where everyone would rejoice and spring would arrive and the, we would have summer. And then for the, the, the other six months, she would return to the underworld and, and autumn or fall would come and the, the, the land would wither and die and winter would arrive and then the cycle begins again. So, in my opinion, to change Aerith's fate in Rebirth would be to break that cycle, 
which has all sorts of consequences. Um, you know, I, I think no matter how you look at it, um, whether that's in a spiritual sense or a, an environmental sense, once you start to break cycles like that, you know, you you ultimately end up in a, a pretty devastating situation. So I, I personally don't wish to see that element changed. Um, but if they do change it, I hope that it, it, the purpose of it would be to explore what happens when you break the cycle. Um, because I think I think that was that was the idea behind the whispers in the first place um, was to put into everyone's mind, okay, you know the, this this idea of okay, you we're going to face the unknown. We are going to to change what happens. We are breaking this cycle of what you are comfortable with, what you feel should happen. Personally, I actually think it was a red herring, um, and my I. I've always been a believer that Kazushige Nojima um, has has drawn from Greek and Norse myths specifically, and is someone who uh, his storytelling tends to to include this idea of you can't escape your fate. So I I think the 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 how remake ends in particular is a misdirection because I think everyone is fated to end up in the same way. Perhaps the details will change, but, you know, those those who, who passed away in the, the original game, those who passed away in other, other games, I, I think that will ultimately be what happens. But maybe the story will lead us down a path of here are the consequences if it doesn't happen the way that it should have. Right. And the, the, the consequences uh, are part of the actions of Sephiroth, in the mm-hmm. game. And something I didn't know that I learned from your book is that the relationship with Aerith, between Aerith and Sephiroth actually changed uh, before the game came out. And you actually yeah. talk about uh, how their relationship sort of parallels the story of um, Narcissus and mm-hmm. Echo, where Sephiroth and Aerith, or I guess Aerith originally was supposed to have some sort of unrequainted love for Sephiroth. Yeah or possibly be his sibling. How do you think that would have changed the dynamics of the game? Because I find that really fascinating. Um, I think the the actual, the sibling element of it was the very first draft, uh, but that quickly went. Um, the Unrequited Love story actually hung about quite a lot and it was eventually replaced, Zach replaced that element um, of the, the sort of the missing lover. But, I think it was it was quite a cool idea that uh, they would have been unrequited lovers, or, or sorry, not um, there would have been an, an unrequited love element. Um, in in the original game, there's actually not a huge amount of interaction between Sephiroth and Aerith. Obviously, what they represent are two of the main things. You know, you've got Me- Sephiroth who represents Meteor, Aerith who represents Holy, and they are at odds with one another uh, in in terms of the large-scale concept, but they actually share very little screen time. Um, But obviously the the screen time that they do share becomes one of the most iconic scenes in video game history. Um, So I think the unrequited lover aspect to that would have added an even deeper degree of of tragedy. Um, But it's... I don't know. It's a... You sort of... You've put that idea in my head, and it's it's not it's not, <laughs> it's not a question I was expecting, but it's a really interesting one. Um, I I think the because there is enough history there in terms of their respective relationships with Hojo, that there would have been quite a, a lot that could have been played on. Um, in terms of the the, the narcissist myth, um, I I found that that was, um something that uh it was it was an intriguing idea of of because narcissus um there are two variations or two two kind of core variations of the story and one is to do with unrequited love with echo and the other one is to do with his own you know the death of his sister so it seems to have been quite an interesting coincidence that 
both of those happen to be uh, draft versions of the, the Sephiroth and, and Edith relationship. But yeah, it's, um, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, my answer to your question is I actually don't know. It's, it's, a, it's one I would like to go away and have a think about. <laughs> I like to keep you on your toes because yeah. that, that really uh, surprised me. I didn't know about that early relationship between them. So you cover a lot of different myths. You cover also the heroes. Uh, and I'm curious to know what your your sort of favorite Greek myth is because we have all of these, uh, you know, action adventure stories that have to yeah. do with different heroes. You know, Perseus, Odysseus, Theseus, a lot of yeses. Um, yeah. Do you have a particular <laughs> favorite uh, myth? Um, well, the ones... I, I do, but the it's actually been been introduced. Uh, I I added a few chapters when when originally the the book was um, being crowdfunded on Kickstarter. Um, I I had a, a different edition that was released to Kickstarter individuals, which included some chapters with respect to the Trojan War. And one of one of my the answer to your question is my favorite myth is actually the Trojan War. Um, and I, there are so many parallels between Sephiroth and, and Achilles that it's it's crazy, you know, all the way from his origins um, to, you know, how Sephiroth and over the course of the compilation, not, not necessarily in the original game, but over the course of the compilation actually starts to lose faith in whether or not he should be a hero and he, he, he starts to actually seek this abandoning the glory aspect of it only to to of course um completely uh go off the rails at, at Nibelheim the way that um Achilles just loses his mind after the death of Patroclus um so th there are there are actually a frightening number of parallels when when you strip it all down but those are currently going to appear in my next book which is Final Fantasy 7 and the Trojan War but the I think from the book as it is available just now, um, I had a lot of fun with the uh, the Perseus myth, but because it came from the angle of uh, parallels with, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, Clash of the Titans, the movie, rather than the actual Perseus myth, um, I really enjoyed the uh, the Heracles chapters as well. Um, I, 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 I been able to identify that there was a, a similarity between Vincent Valentine and the the labors of Heracles, but then kind of step back and look at well, actually, it's it's not it's not just the labors that there are connections to. There's there's actually a bit more to it than that, and, and sort of other aspects of Heracles's life. So I I really I really had a lot of fun uh, writing those two. So probably. Other than the Trojan War, probably the Heracles myth would, would be my favorite. Then you actually brought up earlier that you are writing a book about uh, how the Trojan War inspired Final Fantasy VII. And I wanted to know, how is how is that going? When can, when can we expect yeah. it? <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to that book as well. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, I'm aiming for it to be later in 2024, uh, certainly the second half of, of 2024. Um, mainly because I assume that rebirth is is going to absolutely consume my life uh, for the next <laughs> the next month or two. Um, I've also been commissioned to produce another Easter egg and lore video series um, for Kubocon. So I I did this with remake where I I basically produced a video series that that um, looked at all the hidden details um, about the compilation that you might miss during during your playthrough of remake um and that ended up being like 17 hours long or something it was it was crazy so hopefully we're actually going to calm it down a little bit uh for rebirth but um uh, i'm going to sort of allocate some time towards that particularly you know just in the the early weeks and months uh, after rebirth's release just to sort of capture as, as much of the hype as I can. Speaking of books, where can we find your book, Greek Myths that inspired Final Fantasy VII and your future book on the Trojan War and your Norse mythology book and all of your successful books? Where can people go to purchase? Thank you. Books? Thank you very much. Uh, the, the the most straightforward way to do it is actually just through Amazon. Uh, so they are actually available worldwide on, on Amazon. 
um, you know, the for for US readers, it would just be Amazon.com or Amazon.co.uk, for example. But um, I've made them specifically available in every region to just reduce on, on shipping costs for, for individuals, depending on, on where you are in the world. For those who are not a fan of, of Amazon, uh, there are also links to alternate sites uh, from my website, which is mjgallagherbooks.com. Um, but if if you have any particular questions or or looking for any specific links, feel free just to reach out on social media. Uh, the best way to get me is, is on Twitter or X at FFVII Novels. Um, and I'll be more than happy to to just talk your ear off about all things Final Fantasy. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Again, I encourage everyone to go out and get Greek, Greek myths that inspired Final Fantasy VII. As you can see, it's just jam-packed with mythology and really interesting information about Final Fantasy VII that even I didn't know about. So thank you again for being on the show. I really appreciate it's it. My, my pleasure. I'm, I'm delighted to be back and thank you so much for inviting me.